Welcome everyone to another meeting of For Our Grandchildren. Uh, my name is Scott McKinley and my host is Beth McKinley and we are so pleased that you could be here tonight on uh, such a pleasant evening after uh, Easter long weekend and hopefully you got out to visit some family or at least get out to visit the new spring arrivals as the migration is, is well into, in, into uh, motion now. Um, now normally at 4RG meets we talk about issues that have to do with uh, dealing with the climate change, things we can do, things that we can uh, make better. Um, but tonight we're going to be taking a moment to be a little more introspective. And uh, what's the effect that climate crisis and our attempts to deal with the climate crisis are having on you and I? And uh, it's difficult to combat something as big as climate change if we're completely overwhelmed by it. So Dr. Jessica Marion Barr will be helping us to examine our doubts and our emotions surrounding the climate crisis and help us to uh, connect with a sense of hope. But first, a little bit of ORG and some of our upcoming events. Okay, so for those of you who may be new to our monthly meetings, I'd like to tell you a little bit about For Our Grandchildren, also known as For RG. We are a volunteer climate action group uh, and you don't have to be a grandparent to join as well. we are all grandchildren. We are based in Peterborough, also known as Nobuji Wanong in one of the local indigenous languages. However, you don't have to live here to be part of 4RG. <laughs> uh, we gather online on the second Monday of the month, usually to learn and talk about all aspects of the climate crisis and our response to it. We are especially grateful to all of the fabulous speakers who volunteer their time and their energy to be with us tonight. So I will pass uh, this over to John Woodger, who will offer a land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that Peterborough is located in the Treaty 20 Michisagaic territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisagig and Chippewa nations collectively known as the Williams Treaty First Nations, which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog, Ramabusale, and Georgina Island First Nations. For our grandchildren, respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. Thank you. So the mission here of For Our Grandchildren is to inspire we're pretty inspiring, eh? Sure. <laughs> to inspire, to inform, and to mobilize people to take effective action in response to the climate crisis. And I think one of the most helpful um, descriptions I've seen about how to find your place in all of that comes from an author, Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson. And she has a TED Talk and a book. And she has three questions that she says can guide us to find our place in this climate crisis. The first one is what brings you joy? Um, the second one is what are you good at? And the third question is what needs doing? And so the intersection of those three questions is your place. Um, and if that involves volunteering with four grandchildren, you can find a link on our webpage. It will um, take, it will result in a phone call from Connie McCracken, who is our volunteer coordinator. So Dr. Jessica Marion Barr, she is an assistant professor at Trent University and an artist researcher of Celtic, various European and matrilineal Haudenosaunee ancestry, whose interdisciplinary arts-based practice explores creative and collaborative approaches to issues around climate change, species decline, and social ecological justice. Wow, you packed a lot in that, Jessica. <laughs> well done. She has recently exhibited artwork in a variety of venues, including galleries across Ontario and in BC. Uh, you can see her full biography on the Trent University website. I met Jessica a couple of years ago um, because of a public art project that she was working on. Um, and so she was inviting people to collaborate with her to create um, a public installation to bring awareness to declining bird populations. And so the project um, was asking people to fold a paper crane for every bird species <laughs> that has been identified by the, uh, I think it was the IUCN, um, yep, um, as declining in population, as being endangered. And so 
1,400 paper cranes and we were asked to write um, the Latin name and the English name on each bird. Um, and so that's where I, I originally met Jessica and then thought, oh, she would really be good to come and talk to our group. And uh, we had a good chat about the work she does at Trent. And I was really fascinated when she described how she uses art with her students to help them process their reactions to the climate crisis. So without further ado, we are thrilled to welcome Jessica and thank you so much for your time and energy and being here and speaking to us this evening. It is an honor. It's an honor to be with you. And I was so delighted to be asked. So thank you so much. Um, I appreciate everyone's contributions and it's so wonderful to hear about the work that's being done. What I'm going to do this evening is to share and offer some reflections and some frameworks uh, that we might find supportive in understanding and processing feelings we may have around environmental loss change and damage, uh, as well as some worry about the future. And that was pretty clear in the poll <laughs> that came up. Um, so as Beth mentioned, my name is Jessica, and I teach at Trent. Um, so I'll, in the talk, I'm going to try to share a little bit about myself, and then I'm going to share some frameworks, as I mentioned. Um, these are solastalgia, the Anthropocene, ecological grieving, and active hope. And if some of those words aren't familiar to you, I will explain. <laughs> um, I'm also going to share some artworks and art projects. As an artist, um, the arts are my touchstone. So I'm going to share some images um, and artworks to kind of frame and ground uh, what we're talking about. And then we're going to have some discussion. I start with a poem because I, we're, we're maybe talking about a stories that break our hearts. So in lead, uh, Mary Oliver writes, I tell you this to break your heart, by which I mean only that it will break open and never close again to the rest of the world. So let's think about having broken hearts, but only in that sense, maybe of them breaking open and loving the world in a good way. Uh, so I wanted to start, as I mentioned, with a reflection, which might also serve as a kind of extended um, and meditative land acknowledgement to follow up on the land acknowledgement that was shared um, at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, so this morning, I didn't realize this was a school holiday, so <laughs> I was scrambling to um, figure out what to do with my kid um, so I could do some more pre uh, preparing for this meeting. Um, so I dropped him off at his dad's house and before heading home, I stopped at Little Lake, and many of you, if you're from this area, the Nagojuanong or Peterborough area, will know exactly where this is. It's near the canal that leads to the lift locks, the world's largest, I believe, hydraulic lift lock. Um, so I marveled at the sparkling water, which looked so blue in the dazzling sunlight, and I felt awe and appreciation mingled with um, and maybe it was because I knew I was giving this talk, but awe and appreciation mingled with underlying grief and sadness, um, an awareness of how damaged this ecosystem is, how polluted uh, the water or nibe and sediments in Little Lake are or have been in the past, um, how the lake bed isn't really the bottom of the lake, but um, is several feet of compressed sawdust from decades of sawmills being uh, dumping in the Odonabe. Uh, in the 19th century, the Odonabe being the um, Nishinaabemowin name that we anglicize as autonomy, uh, which means the river that beats like a heart. I reflected on how the Odonabe, the watershed and river system has been so altered and damaged by settler intervention. All of the locks that have changed these uh, shining waters, this uh, shining waterway, um, and caused the extinction and extirpation of the American eel and the Atlantic salmon, who used to journey up the river for the Nishnabeg to feast upon. Uh, how the Monomen has been damaged and many of its habitats have been lost. And how the Michisagig have been robbed of their territory and sacred places and hunting and fishing grounds. Uh, these were some of my reflections as I <laughs> gazed at the sparkling waters and also the infrastructure that's been imposed upon them. Uh, so there's much to grieve. And at the same time, I reflected on hope. And I recalled a colleague who said that even if we just greet the Odenabe when we see her, we just say, Anin Gazagen, which would mean 
uh, hello or the light in me sees the light in you and I love you. Even, even that, even just saying that, even in our minds, she said that helps. So I also think of all the healing work that's being done, the water and land protectors, folks working on remediation, detoxification, um, restoring ecosystems, replanting monomen. There's so much hope in that work being done and so much resilience, um, not just in that work, but resilience in the ancient deep wisdom of Mother Earth, of Shok Mekwe in Nishnabe Moen. So these were some of the reflections that I had this morning that I share with you, um, partly by way of telling you a bit about me and, and a, as a bit of a land acknowledgement as well, and a way into this discussion. So I will tell you a little bit more about me, and that includes that I am a mother and an artist. Um, the image on the, your right-hand side there is um, me with my baby uh, nine years ago at a um, an art exhibition called Vernal Pool, um, and Drew, I thought I saw that Drew Monkman is here, and he knows all about Vernal Pools. Uh, I saw something you wrote, uh, Drew, many, many years ago for the examiner or something about Vernal Pools and Harbingers of Spring. This was an art project calling attention to Vernal Pools, and actually, um, one of my most recent uh, art news bits was that the, uh, the Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Museum acquired uh, the sound installation I made for this piece as part of their permanent exhibition, which highlights their local ecosystems and vernal pools. Um, so this is part of my ecological art practice. Um, I grew up spending the summers on the lakes, uh, on this beautiful lake, the shores of um, Juniang Zagaigan, Silver Lake in Nishnabe Moen, uh, currently known in English as Lake Simcoe. Um, and some of these flowers that you see below were the flowers I played with in what we called the empty lot down the road from the cottage that my factory worker, uh, <laughs> adopted Mohawk uh, grandfather had built in the 1930s, 40s. Um, yeah, you, you probably know most of them if you're uh, earth loving peoples from this area. And you know that the one on the far right, milkweed, um, is connected to uh, endangered species, itself being endangered, uh, in danger of uh, being lost to all manner of uh, human interventions, um, and the monarch butterflies who depend on it also at risk. Um, this uh, empty lot that we, my sister and I played in, um, was also lost to, um, it was raised and fancy new homes were built on it. And this was probably my first experience of what, of the first uh, framework that I'm going to share with you, which is solastalgia. The loss of a very personal and close by place. So this term was coined by Australian philosopher, Glenn Albrecht, who in 2005, 2007, wrote that solastalgia, which is a portmanteau of um, solace and nostalgia, and possibly one other word. <laughs> um, it is the distress that is produced by environmental change impacting on people while they are directly connected to their home environment. The homesickness we feel while still at home, the pain or sickness caused by the loss or lack of solace and the sense of isolation connected to the present state of one's home and territory. So you may also reflect on this sense whether you've ever felt a sense of solastalgia before, and you're welcome to share in the chat uh, briefly if you can think of a, a time in your life when a, a beloved, familiar home type environment was changed in some way or or lost. And um, many of us have that experience of a forest we really loved being cut down uh, to make way for urban sprawl or whatever else. Um, so solastalgia is used as a framework for personal loss and for understanding the psychological impact of the increasing incidence of environmental change worldwide. So it can be applied to very sort of personal, just I lost my backyard, uh, or it can also be connected to larger issues of environmental um, grieving. And the next framework, which is the Anthropocene. So this may not be the experience of solastalgia for most of us who grew up with the privilege of living in the global north of the first world, but for those um, in places that we don't uh, have a lot of exposure to from in this culture, um, places where our waste goes, uh, solastalgia is a very real and um, present concern all the time. So this is a picture of e-waste, uh, which is changing um, the environment uh, in the places it's dumped. So the Anthropocene is the, a proposed name for a new geological epoch 
Uh, it names an age in which human industry has come to equal or even surpass the processes of geology and in which humans in their attempt to conquer nature have inadvertently become a major force in its destruction. Uh, that Paul Critson and Eugene Sturmer, uh, Critson is a chemist, uh, was the first to kind of suggest this term Anthropocene as, as a new geological era. So we have like the Pleistocene and the Holocene and perhaps now the Anthropocene. It's not determined yet, but there's good evidence that humans are making a mark on the geological record that would be evident in tens of thousands of years, and that's how we determine a geological age. And uh, <laughs> photographs like this one by Edward Bertinsky um, show ways in which this is happening. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit more. This is from Davis and Turpin. Because when we talk about Anthropocene, we can make the mistake of acting like it's everyone's fault equally. All humans, it's the human, it's human's fault, it's our fault. Um, so the devastation that characterizes the Anthropocene, these authors write, is not simply the result of activities undertaken by the species Homo sapiens. We are not equally all to blame. <laughs> Instead, they say, these effects derive from the contemporary re reality of petrocapitalism. And petrocapitalism is another portmanteau that is pretty easy to figure out. It's like petrochemicals, fossil fuel extraction, and capitalism together. So petrocapitalism is the problem. So we might actually call it the petrocapitalocene rather than the anthropocene. And Donna Haraway has suggested actually that capitalocene is a better term than anthropocene. Points the finger a little more accurately. So these authors write that petrocapitalism represents the heightened hierarchical relations of humans, the continued violence of white supremacy, colonialism, patriarchy, heterosexism, and ableism, all of which exacerbate and subtend the violence that has been inflicted upon the non-human world. So just to be clear, like we're not blaming all humans, right? we're not blaming like the indigenous folks who live in the Amazon, it's not their fault. <laughs> it's the fault of, of, uh, of petrocapitalism as a shorthand. So that's the Anthropocene and photographs like this one by David Maisel showing this cutting into the earth. Um, this is a, a called American Mine from Nevada show just how much humanity, the capitalist industrial humanity has etched its presence into the earth. And in this kind of similar, I chose these images because they also have this kind of swirling constellation effect. Um, humanity is also etching itself into the planet, or again, consumer capitalist humanity is etching itself into the planet by way of plastics. And I'm sure that everyone here is very concerned about plastics. Uh, and there is evidence that it may be plastics that actually mark the Anthropocene as being evident in the fossil record and evident as a kind of geological crust on the earth. Um, they're showing up in all sorts of things, as you probably know. So this is an artwork by Mandy Barker and collaborators. Um, it is 597 soccer balls that had washed up on shores. Um, the artist and 47 members of the public worked for four months to collect these from 87 different beaches in four countries and seven islands within the UK. So it's an, it's a, and this is one of a series of many, many images of artworks that are actually collecting um, plastics and other garbage from beaches and uh, water bodies, and then presenting them um, in these very aesthetically compelling ways to give us a sense of the kind of scope in a way of the problem. Plastics, um, as we know, are all over the oceans and everywhere else. Um, and artists and others are doing work, again, to kind of try to remediate or fix or draw attention to this problem, um, including Angelina Pozzi, or sorry, Angela Pozzi, um, the artistic and executive director of Washed Ashore, uh, which is a nonprofit community organization which tries to educate and create awareness about marine debris and plastic pollution through art. So they organize uh, volunteers to clean up beaches, and then they use all the garbage and plastics to construct larger than life sculptures of the animals who are most affect, affected by plastic pollution. So this is an, in one of the sculptures that they made is this incredible piece that's an octopus that's been created and it's all just plastic garbage that they collected um, and it's huge. So when we think about the animals affected by human pollution and by petrocapitalism, we also might think about extinction. And we are living through what is being termed the sixth great extinction, uh, which is the only anthropogenic extinction. All other extinctions have been caused by like 
natural effect or meteors and um, this this current extinction we're living at, the rate of extinction is at least 100 times the what they call, scientists call the background rate of extinction, and it's purely caused by human activity. Uh, but is it all humans? No, <laughs> it's petrocapitalism. Um, so uh, in 1933, which is 90 years ago, Aldo Leopold wrote, we stand guard over works of art, but species representing the work of eons are stolen from under our noses. And many artists are dealing and trying to process this kind of grieving and memorialization in their art, including Gwen Curry, who's from uh, the West Coast of Canada, who created this piece called Void Field, which is a kind of um, sacred um, remembrance memorial. And each of the tiles in this um, installation commemorates uh, an extinct species with the name of the species and the year that it was driven to extinction. So you see Eastern Elk, Texas Red Wolf, Arizona Jaguar, the Great Auk. More recently, um, when we think about the, this era that we're living in, we think about these kinds of losses, the loss of species and the loss of habitats and the loss of, of uh, ice as well, glaciers. So artist Katie Peterson created a piece called Vatnia, um, uh, sorry, Vatna Yokul, The Sound of, um, which showed as in an art gallery as this image on the left, uh, a phone number in neon lights. But the artwork itself was this really profound meditation on connection and grieving. It was a live phone line. So this was a phone number that people could call. A live phone line connected to an Icelandic glacier via an underwater microphone submerged in this lagoon, um, which could be called from any telephone in the world. And the listener would hear the sound of the glacier melting, which is really profound and really offers this really deep moment of, of kind of connection and contemplation and the reality um, of, of the melting of glaciers, which most people wouldn't be able to witness in person. Um, which brings us to ecological grief. <laughs> um, so we think about these losses, and this is the, another framework that I'm offering is, is this concept of ecological grief, which 10 years ago when I was doing my PhD about it, did not have a lot of attention. Um, and in the years that have passed, if you Google it now, you get millions of hits, uh, including books like Mourning in the Anthropocene, Earth Grief, and one that I'll mention, mention later by Ashley Consolo uh, called Morning Nature. Um, Ashley Consolo is on the um, East Coast in Labrador, works with Inuit on um, ecological grieving uh, in their territory and is one of the key thinkers right now around ecological grief. Um, so she and her colleague Ellis write that climate change is increasingly understood to impact mental health through multiple pathways of risk, including intense feelings of grief as people suffer climate related losses related to, uh, sorry, losses to valued species, ecosystems and landscapes. Um, they write that grief is a natural and legitimate response to ecological loss and one that may become more common as climate impacts worsen. There's some discussion about whether ecological grief or anxiety would be a diagnosis, one that you might find in the DSM. Um, the APA, the American Psychological Association, has recognized it as uh, when people notice or anticipate the loss of species, ecosystems, and meaningful landscapes due to acute or chronic environmental change. Um, but Dr. Um, Bernard Kadubka, who's a physician in the UK, says that climate anxiety is a normal and not rational response to a real climate emergency and not something that should be uh, characterized as a disorder. Um, she says that we all become distressed and upset when we lose somebody through bereavement, and that is a normal response. It's the same with climate anxiety. We are not all sick, she says. We've made the planet sick, or rather, petrocapitalism has made the, the planet sick. She says governments around the world should enact policies to achieve carbon neutrality in the next few decades. She says when we talk about the DSM, we tend to lose the focus on pushing the government's and corporations, RBC, to achieve the targets. And like, oh my goodness, I, I actually screamed when um, <laughs> the our, our friend shared the comments that the CEO of RBC made. I was, that's very upsetting. Um, good thing I was muted. Um, so when we think again about, um, this is another artist who's communicating um, some of these, um, trying to communicate some of these issues in a way that people will find accessible and profound. Zaria Foreman um, also 
communicating about precious and and endangered um, ecosystems and phenomena uh, like these gorgeous ice formations in Antarctica. And if you look at this, would you assume it's a photograph? Yes, it's not. It's a drawing. It, this is pastel on paper. Um, so Foreman creates these incredibly detailed drawings. She writes that artists play a critical role in communicating climate change, which is argu arguably the most important challenge we face. She writes that she's dedicated her career to translating and illuminating scientists' warnings and statistics through an accessible medium that moves us in a way statistics may not. Psychology tells us that humans take action and make decisions based on emotion above all else. Studies have shown, she says, that art can impact our emotions more effectively than a scary news report. So she uses her art to enable viewers to emotionally connect with places they may never have a chance to visit. She writes, I choose to convey the beauty as opposed to the devastation of threatened places. If people can experience the sublimity of these landscapes, perhaps they will be inspired to protect and preserve them. And if we had time, I'd show you a video of her working because it's amazing. So let's think about that protecting and preserving and coming from a place of inspiration, letting the truth, future tell the truth, thinking that another world is possible, asking what imaginaries or what might be possible in, this, in the, in the uh, apocalypse, in the Anthropocene, um, and how we might, we might construct some kind of imaginary, some kind of future that both refuses false hope, so not falsely optimistic, but also doesn't give in to doom and gloom doesn't give into the apocalyptic foreclosure of possible futures. We want to imagine uh, better futures. And this is going to bring me to active hope. Um, so I think about art that inspires and tries to activate people like Christy Belcourt and Isaac Murdoch, who have new beginnings here. This is a call to action. Um, powerful images championing the restoration of balance between all living beings and the natural world. And I think about the Onaman Collective, and you may have seen um, images like this one, Water is Life, as uh, activism and water and land protection. So grief is a really powerful place to start because we only grieve what we love. And when we grieve what we love, we are inspired or should, could be inspired to take action to protect what we love. And that's what Consolo and her colleagues write about. They write about um, ecological grief and anxiety being a sign of relationship and connection with the natural world. And that's a good thing. Um, so they say what is needed are accessible and safe spaces to explore these difficult emotional reactions. We need the political will to ensure that important strategies and supports are funded. And we need res the research required to strengthen and support approaches of healing and resilience. They say that recognizing that emotions are often what leads people to act, it is possible that feelings of ecological anxiety and grief, although uncomfortable, are in fact the crucible through which humanity must pass to harness the energy and conviction that are needed for the life-saving changes now required. So the argument is that we feel it's important to feel the grief because that's what can inspire us to act. So they have six recommendations, and I'll read them really quickly because I, I we kind of got a little behind our time, and I'm trying to recoup it a bit. <laughs> um, uh, first suggestion: more training for mental health professionals on climate change and mental health. Two, uh, second recommendation: enhanced clinical assessments and support are needed. Uh, number three: already proven individual and group therapy strategies should be harnessed to help people reduce the suffering associated with ecological grieving. Uh, they talk about increasing social prescribing and exerting effort towards solutions. So a personal sort of social prescription would be like forest bathing and larger scale social prescription would be like having more trees in cities, improving infrastructure for non-car commuting and reducing air pollution with uh, green energy. They also talk about focusing on families and meaningful goal-directed activities and an equity health approach because the people who experience the most acute forms of ecological grief and anxiety are often those with the least access to mental health resources. So those are six suggestions. I don't know how many of those feel actionable to you right now. So I did a little bit of work to look through, um, I actually looked on the web, some, some websites around just bereavement. Um, so hospice and other organizations that deal with grief talk about um, the th three C's. So I have three suggestions. 
choose, connect, and communicate. So choose what feels best for you. Connect with others who also value the environment and also connect with nature. Hugging a tree really is good for your health and there's data on that. Um, just ask permission first. Um, and communicate, uh, talk about the issues and feelings with those who feel similarly. And that's what we're gonna do tonight if we don't run out of time. Um, there are also resources, the Good Grief Network, um, which is amazing. And Beth talked to me about that and I'm so delighted to learn about it. They offer a lot of resources, including yoga for ecological grief, who knew? Um, and I can share these slides after if you want the links. So I, I'm going to end with two more things and then I'll be done. Um, this concept of active hope is the sort of final framework. Um, coming with a realistic perspective of what's wrong and finding the motivation and the energy to keep going. So I mentioned that Ashley Consola had written an anthology called Morning Nature, and I have a chapter in that anthology. The subtitle, if you can see on your little screen, is Hope at the heart of ecological loss and grief. They found that all of the contributors, they were just gonna call it something much more depressing. And then they found that all of the contributors <laughs> wanted to still focus on hope, even when things were really dreary, because we, we have this will to survive. Um, what is it Rachel Carson said? The, um, the obligation to endure um, and the will to survive. Um, so um, Joanna Macy then has this project, a book called Active Hope and um, workshops that are called The Work That Reconnects that she does with, uh, so Joanna Macy is like an anti-nuclear activist and a Buddhist and a PhD. Um, the central purpose then of her work that reconnects, she writes, is to help people uncover and experience their innate connections with each other and with the systemic self-healing powers of the web of life so that they may be enlivened and motivated to play their part in creating a sustainable civilization. And the work that reconnects looks like this. It looks like coming from gratitude, moving through and honoring our pain for the world, which is where the grieving piece comes in, really feeling it, and then moving to seeing with new eyes and going forth into the world and trying to make and be part of change that is about realistically seeing what's happening but also what would we prefer and how can we act towards what we want instead what would be a better future and what are the steps we take toward that and i'm going to end with just this funny thing because how many people here have driven past this on the dvp and been like what are those elephants or possibly molars doing beside the dvp the don valley parkway in toronto um, did you know that they're not actually just elephants or molars? They are um, a functional uh, bioremedial artwork or actually hydroremedial. So this artwork created by Noel Harding, it's called Elevated Wetlands. Uh, there's a solar panel here that pumps dirty water from the Don River up into these three structures, each of which contains a functional living wetland. And we know that wetlands clean the water. So it's pumped up into the first one, it gets cleaned there, it drips into the second one, gets clean, drips into the third one, and by the time it drips out of that third little elephant, the water is quite clean and can be returned, uh, is returned back into the ecosystem. So this is the possibility. Humanity has the capacity to do this kind of beautiful work to heal uh, the damage that has been caused by petrocapitalism. And I will leave it with that, uh, an, an image of part of the paper crane project that um, Beth mentioned. And thank you so much for your time. Well, that was fabulous, Jessica. There's so much to say, and I feel like what you're presenting today is going to be sort of a framework as we move forward, and we will revisit some of these things. I'm, I'd like to pass things over to Al Slavin to um, make a few comments. Al Slavin is a retired professor emeritus from Trent on the other side of his career <laughs> from Jessica. And uh, he and Linda are very active at for our grandchildren on the board and on our political action committee. So thank you, Jessica. That was really inspiring. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't just about about eco anxiety. It was moving towards hope, and that that was the theme of everything you did. It's obviously a really important issue. I think I read recently that something like eighty percent of youth are concerned, seriously concerned about the environment. It's an incredibly large number. So it's off, obviously, you know, really hurting the health of our society. I mean, the initial poll that was held here just supported that, right? I mean, everybody is concerned at some level <clears throat> about the environment. So 
it was very much appreciated. As I say, it was it was not just a, a discussion about eco anxiety. It was this move towards hope, and that it's. I liked I liked the statement that you made, that was made, that uh, we're all not sick. It's the world that's sick, basically, and we all have a responsibility to try to repair it. And our concern has to leave us in that direction. So thank you very much. It was inspiring and beautifully done. Really enjoyed the artwork. Much appreciated. Do you have a question? Um, Linda, you can go, go ahead. Um, yes, Jessica, I, I was wondering if you were going to sh share um, your, your um, slideshow because you had such great resources. A lot of the books look so interesting. I know we're, we're gonna have the, um, the video, the recording will be there, but the slides themselves will be really helpful because they're faster to go through. <laughs> Absolutely, and they have the links you can click. Um, I sent them to Beth already, and I'm happy for them to be shared. I'll probably put a link to that maybe on the web page would be the best. So Linda Slavin also has a question. Well, in our group, we came to the fact that the um, Reading Sweetgrass is one of our favorite books because getting back to an indigenous perspective is one of the ways we might save the planet. It gave us hope. But I think the other one that I didn't mention is people like Mel Abergere, who just comes and does things because she knows they need to be done. That's inspiring too. So we've got to depend on our youth a lot as well as working ourselves, I think. She's been wonderful. Yep. I'd have to agree with you. When I get down, I think of her and I get back up again. <laughs> uh, Kelly McDowell. Hi, Jessica. Um, thank you so much. That was so amazing. Um, I had never really, yeah, I had never thought about it the way you've presented it. So um, what I was, one, my question is, are there any artists that are working in a way that it that incorporate ritual that give uh the community opportunities you know just sort of more having a ceremonial or ritual way of working around this issue yes and there are probably way more than i know about um two examples that come to mind right away and actually i think one of them was on a slide that i did, felt like i didn't have time for today is uh, an artist named brandon balanger and he's a uh, u.s artist who's both a biologist and a visual artist um, and he has a piece called frameworks of absence or a series in which he takes old vintage plates from like old audubon books from 100 years ago and he very carefully cuts out the image of an extinct species so it's removed um and then he burns it he burns that paper image so that there's just this little bit of ash left and he invites viewers in the gallery to participate in a, in, in some kind of a ceremony with those ashes um as if they're memorializing or having ceremony for that extinct species um so that's one artist that i know who incorporates some that that's just sort of a i don't think it's necessarily connected to any particular cultural tradition but it's sort of it's universal in that sense of i'm more somewhat universal in that sense of that kind of the ashes um uh, in the piece that I mentioned, the Vernal Pool piece, um, there was something that I would maybe in retrospect think of as a bit of ceremony. Um, so the, the piece was um, a participatory and participants were invited to collect snow from places that were special to them. So there was this kind of connection to place and then the, we collected all of this melted snow and brought it together with all of those drinking glasses that you saw kind of looked like a mass of eggs. Um, and then when the exhibition was finished, we did what we called snow gifting. So we took the melted snow water and we poured it into jars and we gifted it to people at the exhibition and sort of in this way that felt a little bit like ceremony like kind of handing the, the, this water this melted snow from one to another and invited them to gift that snow melt um, snow melt back to the earth so they would take that snow and then and put it in a special place water their garden with it so that's just two examples that immediately spring to mind and I would it, it really inspires me though when you ask that to think of more artists or to look into more artists who are incorporating ceremony and I think of like um, like uh, Christy Belcourt and um, Isaac Murdoch and the Indigenous artists whose work is ceremony. Um, so uh, the you know there's there's so much richness in the work of Indigenous artists as well. Yeah. So okay. So eight twenty three. If there's any more comments or questions, otherwise.
I think we'll move towards wrapping up. So thank you everyone so much for coming out and Jessica for volunteering your time and your expertise and your wisdom and just it was so rich, um, just so much gratitude. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure and it's a privilege. And I would love to chat with everyone again.